Hi, my name's John. I was one of Jesus' 12 followers. And I'm here today to tell you about that incident, that, that time that transformed my appreciation for Jesus as Messiah and as my Savior. We had been in Jerusalem. Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, and there was some tension growing between Jesus and some of the religious authorities. So we left the city. We didn't run for our lives, it wasn't like that, but we felt that we needed to get out before something bad happened. And so we left, and we went a fair distance out of the city. In fact, we crossed the River Jordan, and Jesus taught there. And more and more people were coming to trust Jesus just as we did. And it was while we were there on the other side of the Jordan that word came to us that Lazarus was really sick. Now, Lazarus was a friend, a friend to all of us, but particularly a close friend to Jesus. And so we expected that we were going to pack up and head to Bethany, where Lazarus lived. But Jesus said we weren't. We were going to stay put. And he continued to teach. Two days later, Jesus said, okay, now's time. Let's go. So we gathered our things, meager as they were. We crossed the river, and we journeyed to Bethany. Before we actually got into the town proper, there were people there who told us that Lazarus had died four days earlier. We continued into the town. Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Mary, and both of them, one after the other, came out to greet Jesus, and Jesus wept with them. We all wept with them. And then Jesus said he wanted to see the tomb, which is something you do, right? You want to see. It makes it real for you. So, so we all went out to see the tomb. But when we got there, Jesus told some of the men to roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb. And then Martha. God bless Martha. Martha says, Lord, he's been dead four days in the tomb the smell of rot is not going to be good. And Jesus said, I'm going to show you God's glory. And so they rolled the stone away. And then Jesus prayed. And then in this commanding voice, Jesus said, Lazarus, come out! And Lazarus came out. And it was Lazarus. It wasn't something less than Lazarus. It wasn't a zombie. It was, it was Lazarus as he had been, as he had always been. It was Lazarus. Well, you have to know that word of something like that's going to spread fairly quickly, even without social media. And word spread. And Bethany's really close to Jerusalem. So we felt it wasn't safe for Jesus to stay there. So we went off into the wilderness and just kind of found a spot and camped out for a time until things calmed down in Bethany again. And once things did calm down, we were invited to a feast. And the feast was to celebrate the fact that Lazarus was alive. And Jesus and Lazarus would be guests of honor. And so we went to the feast. We gathered around the table. We reclined at the table. In, in those days, the table was low and close to the ground, and, and you, you had cushions and all kinds of things that you leaned upon with your head close to the table and your feet as far from the table as it could be or as they could be. And that's how you ate and visited with each other. It's so much more sophisticated than sitting in chairs, don't you think? And so we ate. And there she was. God bless her, Martha. She's helping to serve the, the food. You could always count on Martha helping out. But Mary was nowhere to be seen until she was there. And there she was, standing at Jesus' feet, holding a container. Nobody else seemed to even notice that she was there until she broke the seal on the container and opened it. And the aroma of nard. Do you, do you know nard? Is that still a really popular perfume? 
Well, maybe it's because it's so expensive they don't make it anymore, I don't know, but it was a really expensive perfume. And the, the aroma wafted through the room and all eyes were then on Mary. And she crouched down by Jesus' feet and she took the container and began to pour the perfume on Jesus' feet. The smell that, that I was smelling uh, told me that this was probably pure nard. It wasn't watered down with anything. That made it really expensive. How expensive, John, you ask? It was expensive and costly enough that a family of four could have survived on what that perfume cost for a year. They wouldn't have been rich by any stretch of the imagination, and there would have been tough days, but a family of four could have survived on what that perfume cost. And there's Mary continuing to pour it on Jesus' feet. I was shocked. Everybody was shocked. The room was silent. I had a quick glance around, and everybody's eyes were big. Mary pouring the perfume on Jesus' feet. And just as the room began to revive from the shock, Mary upped the shock value even more and pulled the pins out of her hair and let her hair down and wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. Now, I don't know about today, but in those days, women did not let their hair down in public, let alone wipe somebody's feet with it. The shock that was in the room was no longer a silent shock. There was grumbling going on, and, and one could be heard to say, this is outrageous, and another one, what a waste. And then Judas, one of us, said, what a waste indeed. This perfume could have been sold, and, and the money given to the poor, it's worth a year's wages. And just as all of us were starting to kind of agree with Judas, Jesus said, leave her alone. She intended to keep this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. And in that moment, the transformation happened. I realized that what I saw as a waste had been a profound expression of thanks. It was an extravagant gratitude. It was costly love. Mary doing that, expressing that level of love and gratitude to Jesus, shamed me. Because I had to ask myself, how thankful was I for Jesus? Sure, Jesus raised Mary's brother from the dead. That's going to get some thanks. But Jesus had also done all kinds of things for me and his other followers and so many other people. How much did I love him? How much... How much was I willing to express that? And I kept asking those questions all through the evening and, in fact, through the night. Ever have those nights when sleep just doesn't come because the wheels keep on turning? That was me. I even began wondering if there was more to it than just an expression of gratitude. And the next morning, I found there was more to it. Jesus said it was time to go into Jerusalem. So we gathered up, and we had headed out on the road, and we found the closer we got to Jerusalem, the more people there were. There were people lining the sides of the road and people waving palm branches, and then the crowd was cheering and started to shout out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Hosanna in the highest. The King of Israel. You see, Mary believed, no, no, Mary knew that Jesus was the Messiah, the king that God had promised to send for a long time. 
Messiah means anointed one. Well, Mary had anointed Jesus with everything she owned when she poured that perfume on his feet. To Mary, Jesus was Messiah and Savior and King, and she expressed extravagant gratitude to him. To me, Jesus was Messiah and Savior and King, and what did I express? Who is Jesus to you? And what do you express? Well, Jesus' story wasn't over. We continued on into the city. And we went to the temple. And Jesus taught in the temple courts. And the friction and tension between him and the authorities grew up more and more to the point that on Thursday night they arrested him. They tried him in a mockery of justice and found him guilty of something and condemned him to death. Then they took him and they beat him and then they flogged him and they mocked him and then they took him outside of the city and there they crucified him. And Mary continued to express her costly love because she was there the whole time. right up to the point that he died. But then Jesus' story wasn't over then either. In fact, Jesus' story doesn't end. Jesus' story has no ending. And God raised Jesus. The Father raised Jesus to life again on the third day, on the Sunday after he had been killed. But Jesus' resurrection was more than what happened to Lazarus. Lazarus came back to life just as he was, and he continued to live, and then years later he died, just like everybody else. But Jesus' resurrection was different, of a different quality, a different kind. He was like he was before, and he was different from what he was before. Jesus' resurrection is an eternal resurrection. He can't die again. Death has no hold on him. And in that is the proclamation of the Father saying, my son is Lord of all. God forgives our sins in Jesus through the cross and through his resurrection. What does that mean? What does that mean to us? Perhaps you have not yet come to accept Jesus as Savior and know him as Lord. If that's the case, what what does Mary's witness mean? What she did, what does that mean to you? What does her extravagant gratitude say to you? What does her costly love proclaim to you? Or perhaps you do trust Jesus as Savior. You do live with him as Lord. And if that's the case, what does Mary's witness mean to you? What are you, what am I willing to sacrifice as an expression of our gratitude for Jesus, our love for Jesus? Will we have extravagant gratitude? Will we have costly love? I want you to wrestle with this this week. I want you to wrestle with Mary's response of gratitude 
and what that was and what that meant to her and the depth of her gratitude for Jesus. And I want you to ask yourself that question. What does my gratitude look like? What should my gratitude look like? Let's pray together. Our loving God, we thank you. We thank you, and the word is just not sufficient. There's a depth to our thanks to you, Lord, for all that you are and all that you have done. You are faithful to us, always. You have been, and you promised always to be. You remain faithful when we turn away from you. You remain faithful even when we turn on you. You remain faithful when we pretend you don't exist or we pretend that you don't matter. You continue to remain faithful and to love us. And from the depths of our souls, Lord, we thank you. But you are not just faithful. You give us so much in him. You came to us in Jesus. And Jesus lived for us and he died for us and he rose again from the dead for us. And we thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the salvation that you offer us in Jesus. We thank you for life and hope and peace and all the things that we know in Jesus to life eternal. We thank you for the witness of Mary. We thank you for her extravagant gratitude, her costly love. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be more like Mary. Help us to thank you as you truly deserve. Our God, we pray for this world and the various things that are going on around this world. We pray for those places where there is injustice and oppression. Uh, This day we remember the genocide in Rwanda now 25 years ago, and, and the memory of that fills us with horror, Lord, of violence that didn't have to happen. And we pray, Lord, your blessing upon those who still carry the scars of that event. And we pray for all those places in this world where there are tyrants in power, and we pray that you would take them down. And that you would place good people in authority over the nations. Lord, we pray your blessing upon this city and upon our neighborhood here around us. We pray that you would use us as signs of your grace to all the people in this neighborhood. May they see that gratitude in us and want to know why we are so grateful. Make us a blessing to one another, Lord, and to all we meet. Our God, all these prayers we offer you in Jesus' name. Amen.